go to hell? Where is hell? And how would I go there? I know. I'll ask the Google. Where is hell and how do I get there? Hell, Michigan. Hell, Michigan. Go to hell. Mayor of hell. About us? Shop? Weddings in hell? What the hell? I gotta see this. There's a saloon I'm on the highway to hell I've arrived in hell It's not quite what I expected We've got snow coming down Burr! I thought hell was gonna be hot I think those Baptists were pulling my leg Good thing one of the locals had extra clothes for me Nice people here in hell Good people and I don't see any dead people. Nobody screaming. No torment. Got houses. A little snow flying. It's a little windy. What's this? We got a Pontiac over here. This is weird. Let's let's take a look at this. What? Lyft and Uber in hell? Who, who would have thought that? This is definitely not what I expected. But here you have it, the real hell. Who knew? I'm heading to the saloon. Can you answer this question correctly? What is at the ends of the four Christian hells? Three, two, one! Life. Below this video, you will see show more if you're on a desktop or more if you're on your phone. Click that. In the description of this video, there are four links to a very detailed series of four articles I wrote entitled, The Ends of the Four Christian Hells. I invite you to read those as a supplement to this video. People who deny the salvation of all by God and Christ often make comments on my videos and include references to hell. Usually, in my reply, I zero in on that word hell and I ask them, to which hell are you referring? I then give them the four options to choose from. Sheol slash Hades, Gehenna, Tartarus, or the Lake of Fire. I don't recall that I've ever gotten a direct response to that question. They either change the subject or go away. Hopefully, they go away to actually research the topic of hell. They are probably surprised to realize that the word hell in their favorite translation is actually a word used to translate several different words in the Hebrew and Greek scriptures. Let's take a quick look at how some of the most popular Bible versions of today promote the idea of mainstream Christianity's hell. I'm here on the source for all truth, Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, hell in Christianity. If you scroll down, You'll see a handy little chart here concerning the New Testament and hell, and you'll see that Wikipedia acknowledges that three different New Testament words appear in most English translations as hell. So if we take a quick look here, here is the Greek New Testament. We have Hades, Gehenna, and Tartaru, which is actually a verb. We have the translations, the King James Version, New King James, the New American Standard Version, the New International Version, the English Standard Version, contemporary English version, and the New Living Translation. So if we look at Hades, we have some different translations of this across the board. The King James Version translates it as hell, and the New King James as Hades, NASB Hades, NIV Hades, ESV Hades, the CEV, Death's Kingdom, the New Living Translation has Grave. But if we look into this a little further, the King James Version translates Hades nine times as hell and once as grave in 1 Corinthians 15.55. If we look at the NIV, the 2010 NIV translates Hades se seven times as Hades, two times as Realm of the Dead, and the 1984 NIV translates it four times as Hades, twice as Depths, twice as Grave, and once as hell. How's that for consistent? If we look at the ESV, it has eight times as Hades and once as as hell. And if we look at the CEV, oh boy, the CEV has it twice as hell, once as death, twice as grave, once as world of the dead, and three times as death's kingdom. Oh my god. And the New Living Translation, once as place of the dead, 
twice as the dead, and six times as the grave. Oh boy. If we take a look at Gehenna, we see across the board that all these translations translates Gehenna as hell. And if we look at Tartaru across the board, all of these translations translates it as hell. So we can see from this chart that there's not a lot of consistency. And even looking at the individual translations from the King James Version, they translate Hades as hell, Gehenna as hell, and Tartaru as hell. You can go to hell, hell, hell. <laughs> And all the other ones translate Gehenna and Tartaru as hell. Hmm. Apparently God didn't know what he meant to say, so these quote-unquote translators have corrected him. Thanks, but no thanks. Now I want to add to the mix the Concordant Literal New Testament, which is my go-to translation. It translates Hades every time as unseen, Gehenna as Gehenna every time, and Tartaru as Tartarus, the one time that it occurs. So we see that it is very possible to be consistent with the handling of God's words when translating from the Greek into the English. Unlike all of these other versions listed here, the Concordant Literal New Testament maintains the distinctions between Hades, Gehenna, and Tartarus, acknowledging that God knew these distinctions as well. But as we can see, that is not done by the common popular translations, which can be very misleading when translation is inconsistent. And in this case, on such a large topic as hell, it can be very damaging to those who actually believe the mistranslations. Only one of these versions listed here took the Apostle Paul's words seriously from 2 Timothy 1.13. Have a pattern of sound words. Within mainstream Christianity, there are various ideas and nuances around the topic of hell. But one thing they all have in common is this. Hell is everlasting. Its duration is forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And ever, and ever. In this video, I will refer primarily to the King James Version's use, or rather abuse, of the word hell. Let's go! Hell number one, Sheol, Hades. The Hebrew Sheol is synonymous with the Greek Hades. The Greek word Hades means unseen. Sheol means unknown and is connected with the idea of ask or request because no one knew or could see the answer to the question, Mama, where did Uncle Billy go when he died? So when we seek to know where the dead are, here's the answer. Mm. Jeff Benner says regarding Sheol, the ancient Hebrews did not know where or even what Sheol was. To them, it was an unknown place, hence its relationship to Sheol meaning unknown. Ancient Hebrews never speculated on something unknown. To them, it was simply unknown and left at that. But one with a Greek mindset always desires to know the unknown. It is our Greco-Roman Western mindset that needs to know where and what Sheol is. One vital truth about Sheol Hades is this. All of the dead are there. The goodies and the baddies. The KJV translates Hades 11 times, 10 times as hell and one time as grave. Translating the Greek word Hades as hell is bad enough in the King James Version, but its treatment of the Hebrew word Sheol is even worse. Let me explain. In the KJV, Sheol, the unknown, is translated as hell 31 times. The problem with this? Sheol actually occurs 64 times in the Hebrew Scriptures. In addition to being translated as hell 31 times, the KJV translates Sheol as grave 30 times and pit 3 times. So here apparently God misspoke over half the time on Sheol and needs to be corrected, right? Why hell half the time and grave half the time? Is there a good reason for this? No. But the reason grave was used sometimes and hell other times for Sheol is this. Some of the goodies in the Old Testament, namely Joseph and his father Jacob, are connected with Sheol. And we can't have these two goodies burning in hell forever now, can we? The two goodies, Joseph and Jacob, are connected to Sheol in Genesis 37, 31 through 35 from the King James Version. 
And Joseph's brothers took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father Jacob and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, it is my son's coat, an evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes, and put sackcloth upon his loins, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave, which is Sheol, unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. So according to this translation in the King James Version, Joseph and Jacob would just go to the grave, no big deal, right? Grave here in verse 35 is from Sheol, but if the KJV translators were consistent in their use of hell and put hell here, now we've got a whole new ball game. Let's do that. Let's insert hell here and read through verse 35. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, For I will go down into hell unto my son mourning. So if the KJV translators were consistent, we would have Joseph and Jacob going to hell. Now remember, the Christian hell lasts forever and ever, and no one escapes or is rescued from there. And that just won't work in this situation because of what Jesus said concerning Jacob in Matthew 8:11. Matthew 8, 11 in the Concordant Literal New Testament. This is Jesus speaking. Now I am saying to you that many from the east and the west shall be arriving and reclining with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of the heavens. Obviously, if Jacob was stuck in hell forever and ever, he would not be reclining with Jesus, Abraham, and Isaac in the kingdom of the heavens. That is why the King James translators use grave for about half of the instances of Sheol in the Hebrew scriptures. The KJV translators knew that they would paint themselves into a very tight corner if they used hell in every occurrence to translate the Hebrew Sheol. So they just used the word grave for Sheol instead of hell to rescue Joseph and Jacob from everlasting torment in hell. In reality, what they did was adulterate God's word. They mixed God's pure words with worthless things, such as the word hell. Joseph and Jacob will both be resurrected out of Sheol, not hell, and they will each have their part in the kingdom of the heavens. But guess what? The baddies will also be resurrected out of Sheol at the great white throne. Revelation 20, 13 through 14 describes events at the great white throne from the King James Version. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell, translated from Hades, delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell, from Hades, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Interestingly, the KJV translators use the word hell when speaking about Hades giving up all of its dead. Is this the everlasting hell mainstream Christianity keeps talking about? This hell is very obviously not eternal or everlasting or forever. This hell gives up all the dead that it is holding and then it is cast into the lake of fire. Like I said, at the end of the four Christian hells is life, as all people, all the baddies, and all the goodies are alive at this time at the great white throne. Even though there will be judgment at the great white throne, and it will be quite intense, that is better than death. Ecclesiastes 9.4 from the King James Version. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Oh, the wisdom of Solomon. The judgment at the great white throne will be better than death because Christ and his saints will be judging in order to achieve the beneficial purposes for the judges and the judged. This experience of those being judged is just part of God's plan in making them who he desires them to be, to be like Christ and to be like God. So much for Christianity's Sheol slash Hades everlasting hell. You're a liar! Oh my God! But wait, there's more hell! Hell number two, Gehenna. Gehenna, highlighted in green, is a valley to the south and west of Jerusalem. It has a tremendous history in connection with the nation of Israel. It is currently a peaceful place where people jog and picnic without tormenting each other. It was not always like this. 
the jogging, and the picnicking. Children were burned alive in the valley of Gehenna in the horrid fires as sacrifices to the false god Moloch. When God's severe judgments came upon rebellious Israel, Gehenna was filled with dead Israelites and God renamed it the Valley of Slaughter. In the upcoming 1,000 year reign of Christ and his saints upon the earth, Gehenna will be the place where the dead bodies of criminals will be cast as a display of capital punishment without burial. Gehenna is the place that Jesus referred to where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, which Isaiah spoke about long ago. Isaiah 66, 23 through 24 from the Concordant Version of the Old Testament. All flesh shall come to worship before me, says Yahweh, and they will go forth and see the corpses of the mortals who transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched, and they will become a repulsion to all flesh. But will Gehenna be the everlasting hell that Christianity promotes it to be? Matthew 18, 8 through 9 from the Concordant Literal New Testament. Jesus says, Now if your hand or your foot is snaring you, strike it off and cast it from you. Is it ideal for you to be entering into life maimed or lame, or having two hands or two feet to be cast into the fire Aeonian? And if your eye is snaring you, wrench it out and cast it from you. Is it ideal for you to be entering into life one-eyed, or having two eyes to be cast into the Gehenna of fire? Please note the parallel in this passage. The fire that one could potentially be cast into is the fire Aeonian, which is paralleled with the Gehenna of fire. Very interesting. Things that are Aeonian are confined to the Aeonian times created by God and Christ. The Aeonian times are made of the eons, and each eon has a beginning and an end, and the fullness of the Aeonian times has a beginning and an end also. Gehenna is not everlasting or eternal or forever. It is Aeonian. Remember, Gehenna is a valley outside the city of Jerusalem on this present earth. Do you know what happens to this present earth that Gehenna is a part of? 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. Now the day of the Lord will be arriving as a thief, in which the heavens shall be passing by with a booming noise. Yet the elements shall be dissolved by combustion, and the earth and the works in it shall be found. At these all, then dissolving, to what manner of men must you belong in holy behavior and devoutness, hoping for and hurrying the presence of God's day, because of which the heavens being on fire will be dissolved, and the elements decomposed by combustion. Yet we, according to his promises, are hoping for a new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness is dwelling. At the end of the next eon, which is also called the Day of the Lord, which includes the 1,000 year reign of Christ and his saints on the earth, this present earth that we are now on will be destroyed, and it will be followed by a new heaven and a new earth. We see this same event revealed to us in the book of Revelation. Revelation 20, 11 through 13 and Revelation 21, 1. And I perceived a great white throne and him who is sitting upon it, from whose face earth and heaven fled and no place was found for them. And I perceived the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And scrolls were opened, and another scroll was opened, which is the scroll of life. And the dead were judged by that which is written in the scrolls in accord with their acts. And the sea gives up the dead in it, and death and the unseen give up the dead in them. And I perceived a new heaven and a new earth, for the former heaven and the former earth pass away, and the sea is no more. When the present earth is gone, Gehenna will be gone also. Those who were dead in it will be resurrected at the great white throne. Again, at the end of this Christian hell is life. Please note that the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Nations, which is 99% of the world, never mentions Gehenna. Oh my God, there's more hell to come. Hell number three, Tartarus. Tartarus is mentioned only one time in the Greek scriptures. 2 Peter 2.4 For if God spares not sinning messengers, but thrusting them into the gloomy caverns of Tartarus, gives them up to be kept for chastening judging. The translation of Tartarus is actually from the verb Tartarosus, which means thrust into Tartarus. While dead humans are held in death, sinning messengers or angels are not dead and are held in Tartarus. 
there are no humans in Tartarus. The sinning angels are kept there until their chastening judging. Then Tartarus will be emptied. Jude also tells us about this. In Jude 6, we read, Besides messengers who keep not their own sovereignty, but leave their own habitation, he has kept in imperceptible bonds under gloom for the judging of the great day. Again, there are no humans here. This is a holding place for sinning messengers until the judging of the great day. Peter used the well-known Greek mythology of Tartarus to teach the truth regarding the sinning messengers. His use of it does not condone the mythology of Tartarus. In the mythology, titans or gods were held in Tartarus to prevent them from endangering others. Peter knew how this aspect of the myth paralleled the truth, so he used it. It's as if Peter said, hey, we've all heard this mythology of Tartarus that the titans and the gods were held there to keep them from endangering others. Well, God actually did something very similar with sinning angels. Even though the KJV translates Tartarus as hell, there are no humans being held there. There are no humans dead there. So, technically, there isn't life after this Christian hell because there is no death there. The sinning messengers are alive, but they are being held in a form of angelic prison. But even these sinning messengers will be reconciled by the blood of Christ. Yes, our Savior is so good that he can even reconcile bad angels. Colossians 1, 16 and 20. For in the Son is all created, that in the heavens and that on the earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or lordships or sovereignties or authorities, all is created through him, and for him, and through him to reconcile all to him, making peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether those on the earth or those in the heavens. God, through his Son, created all, including the sinning angels in Tartarus, and he reconciles the same all, making peace through the blood of his cross. And here is the result of his reconciliation of all, including the sinning angels currently being held in Tartarus. Philippians 2, 9-11 through 11, Wherefore also God highly exalts him, and graces him with the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should be bowing, celestial and terrestrial, and subterranean, and every tongue should be acclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord, for the glory of God the Father. Here we have the entire fully reconciled creation acclaiming that Jesus Christ is the Lord, for the glory of God the Father. This is the end for the sinning angels. Peace and harmony with their Creator, through the work of Christ. Please note the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to 99% of the world, never mentions Tartarus. Well, there you have it. All three distinct places, which are kept distinct by the words that God used in the Hebrew and Greek scriptures, translated as hell by the KJV. And I don't see anything matching Christianity's everlasting hell. Maybe that's because Christianity's everlasting hell doesn't exist. It's not found in the Hebrew or Greek scriptures, but it is alive and well in the many faulty translations led by the ultra-faulty King James Version. The Sheol Hades hell comes to an end and all in it are resurrected. The Gehenna hell comes to an end and all those in it are resurrected. Tartarus hell will be emptied and its former inhabitants judged and reconciled by Christ and his saints. So Christianity, what else you got? Are there any other potential candidates in the scriptures that will legitimize your proclamation of an everlasting hell? Hell number four, the lake of fire. I'm not aware of any Bible version, even the really bad ones, that translate the lake of fire hell. But let's just play along and say, even though the King James Version tells us that hell is cast into the lake of fire, that the lake of fire now becomes hell. Just play along. I will admit the lake of fire, aka the second death, does kind of fit Christianity's description of hell. There's fire, there's people, albeit dead people. Satan is there. What more do you want? I knew it! This is the end of the road for the baddies! Not so fast, pale face. It must be everlasting to justify Christianity's claims about hell. Rats! The only indication of the duration of the lake of fire found in the book of Revelation has to do with Satan, the wild beast, 
and the false prophet. Revelation 20.10 And the adversary who is deceiving them was cast into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the wild beast and where the false prophet are also. And they shall be tormented day and night for the eons of the eons. If Satan's torment comes to an end, lasting only for the eons of the eons, I say only in relation to forever and ever, and he is reconciled by the blood of Christ and acclaims Christ to the glory of God, just like the sinning angels we looked at earlier, does it not make sense that those who are dead in the lake of fire will also live again and acclaim Christ? Yes, that is exactly what they will do. Revelation takes us only so far. The Apostle Paul takes us all the way to the consummation of the eons where the second death is rendered completely inoperative. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 28. The Apostle Paul takes us farther into the future than the book of Revelation. For even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. Yet each in his own class, the first fruit Christ, thereupon those who are Christ's in his presence, thereafter the consummation, whenever he may be giving up the kingdom to his God and Father, whenever he should be nullifying all sovereignty and all authority and power. For he must be reigning until he should be placing all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy is being abolished, death, for he subjects all under his feet. Now whenever he may be saying that all is subject, it is evident that it is outside of him who subjects all to him. Now whenever all may be subjected to him, then the Son himself also shall be subjected to him who subjects all to him, that God may be all in all. Will there be life at the end of the lake of fire? Yes. Verse 22, For even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. All will be vivified, made immortal and incorruptible because of Christ. And we see the consummation of the eons in verses 24 through 28, which includes in verse 26, the last enemy is being abolished, death. This is speaking of the second death, which is the only death that remains at the time of the consummation of the eons. And finally, when all have life and death has been abolished, verse 28, God will be all in all. There you have it, the ends of the four Christian hells. And the ends are life. And the ultimate end of God's plan for all is life with him as the all in all. God is just, but mainstream Christianity turns God's judgments into the end of the story for most of God's creation. It is not. God uses judgments on the way to his goal for his creation, all of his creation. For mankind, that is salvation from sin and death, peace and reconciliation with their creator, immortality and incorruption for all of humanity, and the honoring by all of creation of God and his son. Even his judgments for those outside of humanity are not the end of the story for those judged. Peace and reconciliation with God will be their end. There is nothing in all of God's pure words in the Hebrew and Greek scriptures that justifies mainstream Christianity's proclamation of an everlasting hell. Life with God will be the end for all. Please remember to look in the description below for the links to the four articles that will supplement and expand upon this video that you've just watched. And I invite you to watch this video next. Michigan. Hmm. Yeah. They mixed God's pure word with worse look. They mixed God's pure words with worse. They mixed.